we'll be back at two with Shunando and Deep Dr. Rai. Meanwhile, the Raskin Bond session is on at the Soil Lumiere. So you could make your way there. I'm nobody special, <laughs> except that I wrote a book about Shubas and Shara Chandra Bose called Brothers Against the Raj. My name is Leonard Gordon, and I am a great admirer of uh, the gentleman to my right, Shunanda Dr. Rai, who I've known on and off for a very, very long time. And it's a great pleasure to introduce him and his son, who has just published a book, The Making of Indian Diplomacy, published from Hearst in London and OUP in India. And I am going to let these, this pair, father and son, speak to each other. And uh, if I can think of anything to say, I'll say it. But otherwise, I leave it to them. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much, Lenny, for saving the day, not just for Deep and me, but for all of us who've been waiting here so patiently, for the organizers. For a book event, this is perhaps not organized at all. I mean, we have a place to sit and some people and the facilities. I, I'm told that everyone who should be in control is in the author's house. What the author's house is, I don't know. It's probably a rest house with lavish entertainment they're, facilities. They're, they're, mo they're mobbing Ruskin Bond. Ah, they're mobbing Ruskin Bond. Well, we are not, uh, we are a more adult audience yeah. here. Yeah, Rus Ruskin Bond is not here. If, if you want him, you go elsewhere. But if you want something about Indian diplomacy, please stay here. Now, this book, Deep's book, The Making of Indian Diplomacy, has provoked, unintentionally, I suppose, controversy right from the beginning. Dr. Manmohan Singh released it in Delhi at the World Wildlife Fund place, I think, on the 10th of July. And that itself was a controversial event because of intense security the doors were closed an hour and a half before the event, and a lot of VIPs couldn't get in. And one of the VIPs, a lady whose nationality some newspapers described as Turkish and some as Iranian, assaulted one of the black cats, one of the special guards posted outside, slapped him. And that was in all the papers, and that was on television, not, not about the book. He didn't return her her, her physical assault. Whereupon, another member of the audience, I s got to know all this from newspaper reports outside because during the function I was inside, another member of the audience took him to task for not hitting her back. And he said he wasn't going to be violent and that other man was an Afghan. So we had this international incident outside the World Wildlife Fund with Dr. Manmohan Singh inside and uh, and a lady of doubtful nationality, Iranian or Turkish, assaulting an Indian policeman and an Afghan urging the Indian policeman to hit back. But he lodged an FIR, a first information report at the police station, and I should imagine that that is still winding its way through the bureaucratic <laughs> processes of India. Now, eight days after this event, I wrote about it in the Telegraph. I have a column every other Saturday, and I wrote an article about this encounter between what Deep in his book calls violence and non-violence. And the response to that was, the very next day, the Telegraph carried a letter from an irate reader to say she was shocked that I should have written about my son's book event. I hope she's not in the audience because she'll be even more shocked today to hear me speak about my son's book. But as a, f a former Deputy Prime Minister of India once said famously when he was accused of pushing his son, some of you may know who I mean, uh, if I don't push my son, whose son will I push? Yours! <laughs> but that's the way Indian way it goes. Now, the book, as I said, has been controversial. The reviews have been very varied. 
a former diplomat, former ambassador called Shottabrata Pal wrote in the week book review, a learned journal called Book Review, that this was an elaborate hoax. The whole concept of that Deep has put forward is an elaborate hoax. In contrast, a French diplomat, Isabel saint mizard writing in the journal of the French Institute of International Relations, said that Deep's thesis that the Mahabharat shaped the thinking of Indian diplomacy still shapes the mental universe of Indian diplomats. So that's the core of the book, that the Mahabharat is central to Indian diplomacy. P. Ramesh Babu in The Hindu called it a scholarly and exhaustive book, to which Professor Pal, uh, not Professor Pal, Ambassador Pal retorted that it was a teenager's rebellion against the status quo. I have yet another opinion from a man called Krishnan Srinivasan, who was a former foreign secretary and who prides himself on being the only foreign secretary of India to have chosen to settle down in Calcutta since Shubimol Dotto in the 50s. And Chris, reviewing the book, said that the approach is philosophical, sociological, and rhetorical. The result of impressive research with countless references to sources and other authorities. Now one can counter that with Ambassador Pal's other remark that the book ascends to the sublime from the ridiculous. And it is a precocious adolescence ranting and railing. Now all this prompts me to say, ask, why should the book, why should uh, serious, supposedly heavy, or expectedly heavy academic book provokes so much controversy. And I'm going to ask Deep what he thinks is special about his book, The Making of Indian Diplomacy. Hello. Thank you very much for that. Since uh, we're running a bit short of short in time, I'll, I'll get straight into it. Uh, there are several what I, I used to be a business consultant before I became a professor at OP Jindal University in New Delhi about a year ago. In the, in the business world, we have this term unique selling points. So my book has, I think, several unique selling points. The first and foremost of which is that I'm the only outsider to have done field work within a foreign ministry anywhere in the world ever. And the reasons for that are quite obvious, quite simple. No bureaucracy likes an outsider pootling around amongst them, noting down their foibles, seeing how they do or what do they not do. <clears throat> so for that very simple reason, this book is the only book that's based on field work. So I lived and worked with Indian diplomats for over a year. Um, the book's point, the p ultimate purpose of the book is to try and figure out why does India conduct diplomacy in the way in which it does? It's not the typical sort of international relations book that comes out about India by all the well-known people who have newspaper columns who say that India should, you know, wave a stick at China or India should do that with Pakistan. It's not that sort of a, that sort of a, what I would say, well, in, in some ways a pedestrianly practical kind of book. What I'm trying to answer are those questions but by going back to the people who make foreign policy themselves. So what I would say that is another USP of the book is that I don't try and say what I think India should do. I try and record what Indian diplomats and their, and their masters, the, the foreign minister at the time and the prime minister of course, thinks India should do and more importantly getting behind that why do they think India should operate in the way in which it does on the international stage? And the way in which I was able to do this, as my father mentioned, was of course by spending a lot of time with them because what I tried to first do was try to figure out why does even a young man or woman today, an IIT graduate, want to accept a salary of about 30,000 rupees and work for the government of India? It, it just doesn't, you know, in, in any practical economic sense, it doesn't make sense why they do that. And the IFS, the Indian Foreign Service, is not like the IAS. We all hear about, you know, corruption and that sort of thing. But the scope for corruption and the, within the Foreign Service is, I mean, it's there, of course, and, I can, and, and there are numerous examples of it in the book. 
but the, the scope for corruption is very, very, very little in, in comparison. So why do people even want to join the foreign ministry? What kind of ideas do they bring? What do they think of themselves and their place in India and the role of India in the world? How do they think of the world to begin with? I'll give you a small example, well, and this might surprise you. One day when I was attached to the Foreign Service Institute, the guard came into the building. This is the Foreign Service Institute, is a Ministry of External Affairs building in New Delhi. The guard came in saying that, bahar mein koi log aaye hain, inke saath milne chahte hain. And he had produced a card that those people outside had of an Indian diplomat at the Foreign Service Institute. But that person wasn't there. Then someone, one of the other diplomats said, I'll go out and meet them. It was a woman. And then the guard said, Magar wo videshi hai. they're foreigners. Then this woman Indian diplomat started giggling and said, nahin, nahin, tab main kaise ja sakta tab main kaise ja sakta So what makes for this kind of a response? That is the sort of thing that I try to get at, and the reason why I try to get at that is to try and understand the thinking behind Indian foreign policy. Jumping ahead, as my father mentioned, one of the, the, the core idea that I think Indian diplomats follow, and this has been, I think, the case from Jawaharlal Nehru, thanks to Mahatma Gandhi, is an idea rooted in the Mahabharat, which is the idea of us all being interconnected. Indian diplomats, Manishankar Iyer once said to me, you can't think of Indian diplomats and our thinking like foreigners think. You know, I, Manishankar, I'm quoting him, he said, I, my, uh, I'm from the South, but I don't think of myself from the South anymore because I grew up in Delhi. And my children, well, my children are back in India, but everyone else in my batch, their children are settled in New York and London. It's an escalator. We don't think of ourselves in this old European nationalistic sense. So it is these ideas which I think make Indian diplomacy unique. And the way in which I can trace, and, and these ideas cannot be explained by European theories. European theories, which are usually used to understand and explain the Indian nation state, cannot explain it in these terms, cannot accommodate these things that Indians themselves say. So they're either cast aside as being Machiavellian, you know, double speak Indians trying to hoodwink other people, or just failures of Indians who are trying to become westernized to become Western. You know, they're, they're trying to be, run a modern nation state, but they don't know how, but they'll get there one of these days. But I take them seriously. And I can take them seriously because one day Shiv Shankar Menon came to speak to two batches of new Indian diplomats, and he began by saying something, asking them something which had occurred to me, that most of them didn't know what their job was going to be as an Indian diplomat. So he said, you, uh, how many of you understand what your job is? And all of them nodded, saying they didn't understand. And then he said, you remember what Krishna was doing before the Great War? And they all said yes. And he said, well, that's your job. And that was remarkable. It was remarkable because in an instant, in a moment, 40 Indian diplomats understood what their job was. And it was by reference to a classical Indian text. Be because that was a text that they have grown up with. They've grown up with it on their mother's lap. They have heard it from them. And those, that text, the stories contain certain sto the, 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 the epic contains certain stories and a particular kind of message about how you think and understand the world. And that is what I'm trying to uncover. And that, I think, is now increasingly a part of the mental makeup of the kind of people who become Indian diplomats, who are not like Shubhimal Dutt, uh, they they're come from a completely different social milieu, which is not anglicized, not westernized. But that doesn't mean that it is empty, that it is a vacuum. They do have their own cultural icons, they do have their own intellectual background. And that, I think, a very good source of that is the Mahabharat, and that sort of exposes how these... Well, that, that provided me with the means of trying to, uh, trying to theorize all the sort of practices that I found in the foreign ministry, which couldn't be explained by Western social science theory. I was about to interrupt. Were you saying? Yeah, I, 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 uh, I'm afraid that uh, I have not had a chance to read this book, but you stimulated me by saying that you'd been able to do this field work, which was unique. And I wondered whether you could just say a little bit about how you were able to do this, what the limitations were, and uh, what you think you were able to gain from that, because this was, as you said, an extremely 
unusual and unique experience. Thank you very much for that. Well, for that I'm entirely indebted to my father. I first, this was around 2006 or 7, I first went to, um, I went to Natwa Singh, who was then the foreign minister. I caught him at a book function and I went and said to him, I'm this person's son in the very typical Indian way and I'd like to do this. And he uh, hadn't ever met me and I don't think he had met my father for several years. But as I could see the wheels turning in his head and he said, very good, very good, speak to my man. His man turned out to be Vikas Swaroop. Now Vikas Swaroop set up various appointments for me in uh, South Block with various people who then taught me how to make the application, how to write the application and that was going to be processed. But then months went by uh, and nothing happened. So then I, thanks to my father, was able to meet Manmohan Singh and being a learned man he immediately understood my thesis and what I was trying to say to him. When I asked him and explained to him what I wanted to do, his response was first, uh, you know, I was in Washington last week and George, as in George Bush, showed me around and he introduced me to his staff, some of whom are of Indian origins. If they can be so open, why cannot we? And then he said, well, do you have a piece of paper for me? I will get my foreign secretary to, to process it. The foreign secretary was Sham Saran and he didn't do a thing to help for the understandable reasons that he didn't want an outsider rooting around. Then I, uh, my father wrote to Manmohan Singh's private secretary at the time, a man called BVR Subramaniam. And BVR Subramaniam wrote back um, to say that he had spoken to his boss about, the, about what I'd wanted to do and his boss had said, it, this must be done. And that's how the file was, was retrieved and processed. Why was it useful? It was useful because I was interested in the actual making of foreign policy, the actual practices. Now, if one looks at it from a theoretical point of view, for example, one, one is told that a bureaucracy is kept stiff, kept taught through written records. That's what, you know, bureaucratic, traditional bureaucratic theory as developed by Weber says. And that is, of course, also the case, uh, we are told, in all the bureaucracies of the West. But in India, <laughs> I've seen piles of reports lying in Akbar, uh, the former Akbar Hotel, uh, slightly damp, with cockroaches crawling all, of them, all over them. Diplomats complained endlessly about the fact that uh, South Bloc never responded to uh, letters that they sent, to, to situation updates that they sent. So ambassadors were either left to do nothing or to make up their own minds. The classic example of this is uh, when the former national security advisor, Brajesh Mishra, when he was an active diplomat, he was posted in Beijing, as you all will know, and he met Mao Zedong, and Mao Zedong apparently stopped and said to him, uh, how long are we going to keep fighting like this? So he immediately sent a note back to South Bloc saying that Mao Zedong has said this to me, it's the first time he's ever spoken to me, and this is what he said, we should do something. And as, as per the norm, even back in those days, he never received anything, any response from, from New Delhi. Now, given his background, his social position, he then flew back to India, met Indira Gandhi, and was able to convince her to, to open channels to, uh, to, uh, to Peking. So this is the sort of thing, these are the sort of, several, I can give you several more examples. Well, I mean, the example that I gave you about the Mahabharata, how do they even figure out what they're supposed to do? It's, they may say lots of things, but I actually was able to see what they did. And that was, I think, the great benefit of the fieldwork. Yes, I want to take you up on the Mahabharata element. If that is the fount of inspiration for Indians, if India, that is Bharat, as the constitution says, is also Ram Raja, then it leaves out a large section of the Indian population who do not subscribe to the Mahabharata or the Ramayana. And we are, I think yesterday there was a session on tolerance, or there's going to be one. Now in this day and age, with a large minority who are not Hindus, how do they respond to the Mahabharata being the, the sort of source and fount of inspiration for Indian diplomacy? Yes, that's, uh, I think that's a very good question, a very pertinent question to, uh, to the world, the India that we are living in today. When I speak of the Mahabharata, 
I don't mean of it in the way in which we usually think of it, which is the way in which the British told us to think of it, which is that, uh, that as, as, as a religious text. When I speak of the Mahabharata and the way in which I think these Indians who now become Indian civil servants, who come from a completely unwesternized uh, milieu, they don't think of the Mahabharata as a religious text in the sense of a Bible or the Quran. They think of it more as an intellectual uh, storehouse. Uh, 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 it's a sort of a, a book that gives you certain ideas about how you think about the world. And the key idea, of course, in the Mahabharata is the idea of dharma which I would say, and this is not, not, not unique to me, but it's the idea of acting in context. There is no right and wrong. You know, the Mahabharata is full of it. The Mahabharata always says you ought to be nonviolent, but then there's the story of Balaka, you know, the, the hunter who had sworn to, be, uh, to never kill anything again, but he encounters a beast that wants to destroy everything. So the point of the whole Mahabharata is that, of course, we know it's not good to kill people, the Mahabharata doesn't bother t explaining all of these things like various other religious texts do, you know, like the Ten Commandments. We know that, right? But the point is, how do you operationalize that way of that, that right in the real world? And that's what the Mahabharata is all about. And the ultimate uh, lesson that I think it gives is that uh, one should act in context. One knows what is right and what is wrong. It's, it's wrong to kill. But how does one live in the real world when faced like Balaka is? He's taken a vow not to kill anything, but he encounters this beast that wants to kill anything. Should he kill the beast and break his vow, or should he not kill the beast, kill, keep to his vow, and then see a lot of other destruction? So it's, an, it's, it's a set of ideas. I'm not the only one to say this. I'm not the only one to think this. The Mahabharata was translated in, by Muslims uh, several hundred years ago. I think uh, about a thousand years ago was the first recorded translation of the Mahabharata and then much later, so it, it was part of the Muslim consciousness. Uh, indeed, the, the Mughal rulers interwove the Mahabharata story into their lineage lines. You know, the Mughals were originally Mongols, so they incorporated lots of things from China and then from the Middle East and then when they settled in India, they tried to incorporate these uh, the Indian ideas into in their actual, you know, biographies in their genealogies. But from an intellectual point of view, the Mughals did not see the Mahabharata as a religious text. They called it the Rasna, I can't pronounce this correctly, but Raznama, which is the book of war. It was a book about the philosophy of war and how one deals with war. That's, that was one of the many, many ways in which Muslims have, have taken to the text. And because I think Muslims have taken to the text, in the same way in which non-Muslims have thought of the text, apart from the the tiny pockets of metropolitan India, which is the rest of India, the billion people who live outside metropolitan India, it is as a set of cultural norms and ideas, which has nothing specifically Hindu or Christian or Muslim about it anymore. And by virtue of being you know, part and parcel of the, of the, of the population of India uh, for so long, and remember of course the reason why it is the part and parcel of the population of India for so long, unlike the Ramayana, is because the Mahabharata, though written by Brahmins, was written in the, in the language of the Shudras, of the lowest caste, because all, the, all, that, all those you know, 12, 2,000 odd years ago, it was an act of propaganda. It was written in the language of the majority, because even though it may have been written by the Brahmins, the Brahmins wanted this set of ideas to be propagated. So therefore it was written in the common language of all the people. So hence, I think it's wrong to think of it, uh, as a, of it as a religious text. It has rather a set of, it's a set of philosoph philosophical ideas which have been imbibed by uh, various other cultural groupings in India. Now there have been objections to it of course. When Akbar got it translated, one of Akbar's translators wrote in his diary two things. One, he was trying to make it more like the Quran with a you know, sort of a beginning and an end, the, you know, where, uh, on which the Mahabharata doesn't really have in that sense. And Akbar apparently scolded him for this, saying to him that uh, if I wanted to read the Quran, I would read the Quran. I want to learn what these people actually think. And uh, this person, this translator also then later on in his diary wrote that uh, such is my fate that I, uh, you know, uh, worship of Allah has been reduced to translating these heathen texts. But I suspect that those ideas, they may persist, but even though those ideas may persist, 
the very ideas of the Mahabharata have seeped into the very texture of Indian society in ways that we don't even know it. If you see the Mahabharata as a moral and not a religious text, which provides a principled foundation to Indian diplomacy, how would you reconcile those tenets and principles with the events between 1973 and 75, whereby through a mixture of political manipulation, populist tactics and military force, India annexed the Kingdom of Sikkim? Yes, I suppose um, what, you're, what, what, what you're getting at, what you haven't said is that um, obviously I'm, I'm painting a positive picture of Indian diplomacy. The picture that I'm painting of Indian diplomacy is one that where the right and wrong is known but you act in a particular context. Sometimes you may perhaps do uh, the wrong thing but it is for a greater good for, a, for, for something that is known to the practitioners. Now, regardless of my personal opinion about what, whether what India did in Sikkim was right or wrong, uh, but let us, for the for the sake of the question, and this is you know, this is a this is an interactive session, so it, I think it'll help us sort of explore this ideas, the ideas of the book a bit more. Let us for, assume that what India did in Sikkim was immoral, that it was wrong. It was even though you know you know what uh, that you shouldn't kill anyone, but you may have to kill sometimes for a greater good. Fine, but let's assume that the case of Sikkim was the killing of a country for no, no greater good at all. What I, my, my counter to that would be that I am not saying that I have the answer for, the, the explanation for Indian diplomacy. But I do believe that I have identified the dominant idea behind Indian diplomacy. And that idea was dominant because of Jawaharlal Nehru who contrary again to popular belief, if one re actually reads all of what Jawaharlal Nehru wrote, Nehru, uh, one of his quotes is, he said, um, I, uh, I find Gandhiji very difficult to understand, but that is because I am a typical modern. But I am trying to understand what Gandhiji is saying. So I would say that Nehru started out like a typical Indian of his generation, wanting to be westernized, but then fell into Gandhiji's uh, clutches and started to undo all of that learning and education that he had received at, in England and, and all that he had imbibed. And one of the lessons that he learned from Gandhiji was this idea from the Mahabharata, which of course Ga Gandhiji uh, translated, dealt with and, and spent hours reciting, etc. throughout his life. I mean, he saw, translated entire chunks of the Mahabharata. So this particular idea that I'm talking about, this dominant strand, was first introduced into Indian diplomacy by Jawaharlal Nehru, thanks to Gandhi. And then, perhaps might have waned over the years. That is traced in the book, uh, which we don't need to go into those details. But at the same time, of course, there were, very, there were, there were other ways of approaching international relations, which were stereotypically and traditionally Western which is, you know, Machiavellian, real politic, uh, that, that th those strands were certainly there. Even during my, during my field work in, uh, in 2007, uh, that was the time when Manmohan Singh was negotiating the nuclear deal. And I would say that Manmohan Singh's way of acting was very much in this uh, Mahabharat mold of acting, but there were diplomats who opposed him, and I'll give you the example. So. It, the United States said to, America, to India at some point that, you know, we're giving you all this. We're giving you this one, two, three agreement. But how do we know that you will support us in the future? You must vote against Iran at the UN. So Manmohan Singh said, fine, we'll vote against Iran at the UN. This was the first time India had even contemplated doing this. And as it happened, this, India did vote against Iran. A senior Indian diplomat, he was, I think, Secretary West at the time, uh, wrote a paper uh, to Manmohan Singh, saying that you know we have firm oil supplies from India, uh, from Iran. Uh, the United States, uh, this nuclear deal is a pipe dream; it may never be realized. Uh, we we are sacrificing an ally in the hope of finding a future friend. I mean, this this doesn't it's ludicrous. Uh, but Manmohan Singh refused to listen to him, 
and uh, proceeded to you know, uh, vote against Iran. As it happens today, Iran remains a great supplier of oil to India. India is able to build nuclear reactors for all sorts of reasons, thanks to that one, two, three agreement, even though the Americans have lost out financially on, 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 the, on the treaty. But the reason why I go into all of this is to show that how even today there remain other f ways of thinking, but I would say they are not the dominant ways of thinking. Um, uh, we wanted to have a little input from you, and uh, if there are questions, uh, uh, we'd like to have you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, my question is about. Uh, I, I belong to the army. I retired from there. I've always found that whenever they had a war with Pakistan or China, with Pakistan or China, it was the intelligence inputs which were given to the foreign service or the foreign for the foreign policy. And it all nearly misfired every time. In 62, what happened? We had a fellow called Malik, who was the IB boss, right? And we had a general who was picked up by Krishna Menon. He said, let's have a forward policy. Not realizing that we don't have the backup to fight the Chinese, because we had nothing to fight the Chinese with. The logistics were very bad. But no, the policy was, Aage badu, aage badu. The Chinese took it for some time, and then they gave us a damn kick. Now, all these are lessons which we learn, but we never seem to learn from those lessons over there. So, my point is that foreign policy cannot be taken in isolation. It has to do with the defense, it has to do with the economic world, it has to do with who are actual friends, who are only pretending to be friends. So, my question to you is, have you got all this in your book too, about such incidents? The short answer to your question is yes. I spent some time dealing with the China question. Uh, the great thing about the Chinese issue, of course, is that there are two ways of explaining what happened in China. One is to, which, which is the dominant way, which is to, which follows Neville Maxwell, which is to just say that these Indian leaders were just plain silly. But I find this a, a rather dismissive um, uh, way of dealing with the leaders of India, who, let's not forget, had managed to free us from the British, had managed to create all of this, this, this country that we now live in, and then to suddenly say that they had managed to successfully do all of these things. You know, Nehru was a very intelligent man and a great chap. But on China, you know, he just got unstuck. He just didn't know what he was doing, what he was talking about. That's, that's the usual way in which the China war is explained. But I find this a terribly dismissive uh, way, an arrogant way of dealing with Nehru and the other great leaders. I think that, that they would have known full well what was, what was going on. Perhaps there is something to that thesis that they were caught unaware, they did not quite understand it. I mean, after all, Nehru was, uh, a, well, he'd been prime minister for several years, but perhaps India, the, the, the leadership of India did not have the requisite experience of dealing with foreign powers. But I think that can only go so far in explaining the issue, which is why I think this issue is still being debated today. What I put forward in my book is another explanation of what the China war came about, what, what was the reason for the China war. And I won't go into all of the details of that now because we don't have the time. But I would, I would remind you to keep in mind that Gandhi's secretary said that, or was, I know, I think it was Gandhi who himself said that I will not shed a single uh, tear for the Indian soldiers who have been sent to Kashmir to defend India, for they stand for truth. And I think that idea of truth was fundamental to Jawaharlal Nehru and shaped his decision makings. And that, even though Jawaharlal Nehru has written about it and talked about it in Parliament, for some reason we historians, my ilk, choose to ignore that. Hello, sir. Uh, sir, uh, being an outsider, uh, how did you approach your thesis and then go about it? Did you have a particular aim in mind uh, when you started it? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I, I, was, I, I was educated in England, and then when it came to my DPhil, I applied to several universities, and the discipline of international relations, which is my discipline, is a very theoretical discipline. And it is believed that all the ways in which we think about international politics 
originated in the Italian peninsula about two and a half thousand years ago. Similarly, you know, the, the biggest story is we have all learned to be, demo, de, to be de Democrats. We have all learned democracy from the British. But that is the, the dominant idea in the social world in which I came from, and which is, I think, also, if you were to go to Jawaharlal Nehru University or, or any of the other universities in India, this is what they would be told. But I think there is, that, that's fine, that, that's great. We've learned, but I would, I would say that we have learned the practicalities of democracy. But there was something already in us before that made us want to become Democrats. And that is what I'm trying to get at in my work. So anyway, this is, uh, this of course, you know, basically then it downgrades the role of Europe in the making of the modern world today. And this didn't go down well at all, so I was rejected by several universities for my default. And finally, I was accepted by the University of Sussex under false pretenses. I pretended to be, follow a particular Western theorist, <laughs> and then I got a place immediately. And then, of course, I went off on my own. This is my thesis. And so, one after another, three supervisors told me to essentially bugger off. So then, finally, I completed under uh, an Italian man uh, called Fabio Petito, who was more willing to, to accept the sort of uh, thesis and ideas that I was putting forward. So that, is, that was a particular set of hurdles. But otherwise, you know, the whole point of, at least in the UK, when one does a DPhil or a PhD, uh, you're expected to do all the work yourself. You get some criticism and guidance from your supervisors, but then they'll say, oh, you, you mentioned this, then you have to read the whole literature about this particular way of thought, and then you're expected to go away and do it yourself. Yeah, you and then, and then this lady uh, and then. Good afternoon, sirs, to all the three gentlemen on stage. Uh, my name is Sushant. Sir, you have said on record that uh, most of the people who are going for the diplomatic services and the foreign services today, uh, at the time you were in the field uh, work, they really don't know what they are go getting into. And you very aptly explained it through the uh, example of Mahabharata, as you said, the example that you gave. Sir, uh, regarding that, I have a question. But um, for people like me who are studying political science and international relations and have an ambition to go into the civil services, um, would you kindly give us a sort of a cheat sheet or some things that we do not know as outsiders what actually happens inside the diplomatic services which we may find to be surprising because we have a very theoretical and a very basic idea as you know sir. So if you could kindly elaborate on that. Well the, the most important thing is of course passing the hurdle of the UPSC exams. But the UPSC exams I think have been incredibly improved uh, over the last seven or eight years. Now you know more about that than I do. I think it's much more relevant the kind of things that they ask, not because they have now introduced a paper on ethics. One can be very ethical on paper and not at all in practice. But to be very ethical on paper requires a certain set of skills, the ability to think logically, to formulate an argument, and then to put it down on paper. So that, I think, is an, is an important thing. The rest of it, uh, given the fact that, uh, I mean, if you, if you do get in, and I hope you do, uh, the bureaucracy knows that the people who are entering the bureaucracy don't know anything about the bureaucracy. So most Indian diplomats will not make a single substantive decision beyond how many bottles of whiskey should be bought for a particular party for the first 15 years of their career. That is essentially their training period when they're learning on the job what they're supposed to be doing as active diplomats. Uh, I just want to say that uh, as a Bideshi who's had some interactions, uh, I had some trouble with the government which had uh, refused me a visa and the person that you mentioned, Shubhi Mal Dutt, uh, entered into this story and uh, I had uh, come to India without a visa and the case was reopened because I had a lot of friends in India. and. Uh, but I had been refused a visa, and I went to Bang uh, what was then Bangladesh, it was 1972, and Shubhi Dutt was the High Commissioner in, uh, in Dhaka, and when I wanted to come back to India, the question was, have you ever been refused a visa? And of course I had been, and, and this might have kept me out of India forever. And I went to Shubhi Dutt, and he was a very senior person. And, and he became, uh, was the foreign, had been, I, I don't know whether he had become or became the foreign secretary. And he said, 
I'll sign it. He signed it. But he had been there a long time. He was a very senior person. As you were saying, a junior person hesitates. And I, I have to say that uh, in New York, I, I was coming to India to give the Netaji oration, and the president of India was to introduce me. And the visa application had to be referred from New York to Delhi. The, the uh, Consul General in New York would not decide. And two days before I was supposed to speak, finally the Consul General said, okay, you have to speak, I'll sign. I mean, they don't want to take a chance. They don't want to take a chance. This young lady. Uh, good afternoon. Um, having worked with the bureaucracy inside the Foreign Ministry, what do you think is the problem that we still don't have a robust foreign policy? Because what I see, I'm a student and I've been following this for a long time and having worked with the Ministry of Defense and everything. Uh, why is the foreign policy in such a piecemeal manner? Why isn't it robust? Is it the bureaucracy which is lacking or there's some system which is missing? Could you uh, shed some light on that? Yes. For that, unfortunately, um, I'm, I'm, I'll have to, in my opinion, I would lay the blame with uh, Pandit Nehru. Uh, I think he, he himself was trying to figure out a way of approaching foreign affairs. He managed to figure it out, which I think I, I detail in the book, and then he put it into practice in, in China. Uh, successfully or not, that is a, that's a different issue. He put it into practice against Pakistan in Kashmir as well. But again, you know, he was learning, right? He was moving from one way of thinking to another way of thinking. There were older elements in him that were, that were tugging at, at the particular policy that he ultimately followed, which complicated matters. The real world is a messy place, of course. But that way of thinking that he was moving towards is something that I found with senior uh, politicians during my field work uh, was, was a sort of way in which they also spoke about foreign policy matters. And the other remarkable thing was that they kept on quoting uh, the Mahatma. They, they kept on quoting him and the, very, the ways in which he had thought about matters. And I don't think that they were doing this to, to impress me. I mean, they had no reason to want to impress me in any, <laughs> for any reason. Um, what Nehru's problem was that since he was moving towards it, he never actually wrote it down. He never it, in, institutionalized it within the foreign ministry in any way. And the civil servants who worked with him, and I, and I think that I'll give you the evidence for, it, for this. I mean, that we all, already know. But the fact that he thought about things in a completely different way is provided by the civil servants who worked with him. Dozens of them write along the lines of what Vishnu Sahay, the former cabinet secretary at the time, wrote that when it came to foreign policy matters, the prime minister had his own mind. We were just technical people. He did not think that we had the intellectual capacity to think about foreign affairs. And I think what Vishnu Sahay meant by that is that Nehru did not think that the civil servants had the intellectual capacity to think like him about foreign affairs. But he himself was grasping, moving towards it. I mean, he was a king. Uh, there were, he was not perhaps a scholar king. I mean, then very, there are very few of those in any case. But he should have perhaps tried to institute it, tried to set up think, uh, a way of training and making this uh, apparent to the civil service. But as you know, he, but before he died, a few months before he died, he said that his lasting regret was that he could not, was not able to change the spirit of the civil service, which he still said was British, was ICS, Indian Civil Service. And that was very way, a very different way of and thinking to the way in which no, he no, was uh, thinking. Yeah, one more question. Thank you, sir, for a very stimulating talk. Uh, if I understand correctly, you've tried to put forth this argument that Indian uh, diplomacy is shaped by the Mahabharata. Now, my question to you, sir, is um, how far are the ideal strategies or whatever um, imbibed consciously? Or are they yes. imbibed yes. unconsciously? Yes, yes, that's a very good question. That's a, it's okay. an extremely good question. I would say that, you know, like, uh, like a chess player, a chess player makes a move, but that, that's, that's an instinctive move. But of course, the chess player has a whole set of knowledge in his head 
which you can activate instantaneously. It's like when you open a door, you know that if you, you have to grip it like this, you have to turn the handle, you have to push or pull. Now that's a whole lot of knowledge, but we do it unthinkingly. And I think that this, to answer your question, it is that unthinking, it is done unthinkingly. And I think it's done unthinkingly because these, these particular ways of thinking are imbibed in the kind of society, are, are dominant in the kind of society in, from which these people come from. Now to give you a very uh, much earlier example of a person like this was K. Subramaniam. And if you read K. Subramaniam, the architect of India's nuclear uh, policy, you'll see that there is this tension between ways, this particular way of thinking that I think is imbibed and not learned, and the conscious international relation that he learned at the London School of Economics. And they didn't gel. And that was the problem that he was trying to deal with. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you to the author, to the author's father, and to the audience. Uh, I've enjoyed this. Uh, and uh, we thank them. And uh, we have to make way for another panel. And I must thank Professor Leonard Gordon for saving the day when the organizers didn't turn up for something they had organized. <laughs>